Hi, I'm Jeff Lawton. I'm a permaculture teacher, designer and consultant and I work all over the world. I've worked in more than 35 countries helping people understand how they can live in a sustainable way. I get people coming to us all the time. We have people who are bankers, we have military people, we have scientists, we have farmers, we have people from oil and gas industry, professional people. And they want to know what they can do to survive crisis that appears to be approaching in many forms. Food crisis, financial crisis, water crisis, energy crisis, climate crisis. There seems to be much evidence out there that crisis of all kinds are approaching. I don't profess to be an expert in those subjects, but I can teach you how to live in a way that can provide your needs and the needs of your family and the needs of your community if necessary in a really beneficial and abundant way so that you can be healthier and secure and really understand what it is to live in a really meaningful way to survive providing all your needs with a system of design. We teach permaculture design to people who have struggled. They find it really hard to understand. How am I gonna provide all my needs? How am I gonna provide my water? How am I gonna provide my housing, my energy of efficiency in all of the things I'm gonna need to survive in a civilized way? until they find that there is a design system out there and we've got examples on the ground. We can teach you how to survive. We can teach you how to survive without a struggle, in, a, in an abundant way, in a way that will provide all your needs and you'll realise that if you follow this system, it becomes a very meaningful way to live and a way that you can help other people as well. In 1996, I was invited to manage the Permaculture Institute in Australia at Tagari Farm in northern New South Wales. This was the foundation institute established by Bill Mollison, the founder of this design system. It's a very complex landscape with 48 dams and six kilometres of water harvest in Earthworks, Wales. And this property was an iconic example of what can be done to rehabilitate landscape into real productivity. It was a dry property originally, and at establishment, it had an overflow of water through the middle slopes of th three two-inch pipes flowing continuously out through fish ponds and aquatic production systems that outproduced the original grazing production of the property in protein on just two acres of land use, leaving of the 148 acres, 146 was actually in surplus to our production on protein. And here was the training site where we put th people through courses so that they could get trained up to go out around the world and work on all kinds of projects. From that site, we actually established projects worldwide in all kinds of zones, not just aid, but emergency aid, like refugee camp rehabilitation and large scale landscapes that have been totally degraded. I went from that experience on to work for aid, on aid projects in the Middle East, places like Jordan and the Dead Sea Valley, where we still work today. We established a project that became famous called, and, and it got called the Green in the Desert Project. So we went and had a look and we thought, oh no, <laughs> this is like, this is the end of the earth. This is like as hard as you can get. This is hyper arid and it's 10 acres of 
almost dead flat, completely salted landscape, 400 metres below sea level, the lowest place on earth, two kilometres from the Dead Sea, right, to about two kilometres where Jesus was christened. Hardly got any rainfall. We've got temperatures in August that go over 50 degrees. Everybody's farming under plastic strips. Everybody's spray, spray, spray. Everybody's putting synthetic fertiliser on. Overgrazed with goats, just like maggots eating the flesh off the bone, down to the bones of the country. Literally like maggots, giant maggots eating it to nothing. So we designed up a system that would harvest every single bit of rainwater that fell on it. On 10 acres, there's one and a half kilometers of swale water harvesting ditch on contour. And when they're full, one million liters of water soak into the landscape. And they'll fill quite a few times over a winter. And then we heavily mulch those swales with organic matter, which was trash from organic fields nearby. And we put that almost half a meter deep so we saved that and mulched our swales, which are about two metres wide and half a metre deep on the trench. Then we put micro-irrigation underneath the mulch. And then on the uphill side of the water harvesting trench, we put nitrogen fixing, very hardy pioneer desert trees, which help shade and reduce wind evaporation and also put nitrogen into the, into the soil and structure the soil for us. And then on the lower side of the trench, we put uh, fruit trees, majoring in date palms as the long-term overstory in the end, and then we put in figs, uh, pomegranates, guavas, mulberries, now some citrus. Within four months we had figs a metre high with figs on, which is impossible. We've done a course, male and female course, trained up some locals and we got a translator who's working for the project. He had his degree in agriculture in the Jordan University. And he got onto his mates and, and said, in the agricultural department, well, you said we couldn't grow figs, we got figs growing and we got figs on them. You better come and test the soil because no matter what you say, we're either growing in salty soil, what we shouldn't be growing, or we've desalted the soil and we'd like to know what we've done. Um, they came in and the salt levels were dropping. So they became interested. The salt levels were dropping around the swells. They said, you must have washed it through. See, normally you put a huge amount of water on and wash the salt through to the lower levels, which just makes the groundwater more salty. In the end, you'll salt it 20 metres deep if you keep doing that. And then it will take a 1,000 years to recover. And we used only one-fifth the amount of water. So the water, they thought we'd washed it all through. No, we'd used one-fifth. That really got them when they realised how much water we hadn't used. We, with the same amount of water normally used on that much area, we could have done 50 acres. Originally, people laughed at us because we didn't put straight lines in. We went on contour with these swells. They thought, why don't you put it? So you've got a bulldozer, you can flatten the desert, you can straighten So we want to go on contour because we've got a longer edge and we harvest the water passively. Then we planted more non-fruiting trees than we did fruit trees. So they laughed at us. This is what we planting unproductive things, more unproductive things, what's the point, you know? In, in soil that won't even grow anything, so, you know. And then, and then we covered all the inside of the swell with a huge amount of mulch, where they scrape all their organic matter off and burn it, like most traditional agriculture. In the middle of winter, we got a funny email saying, we've got a problem. We've got mushrooms growing in the swale. Well, they called it fungus, but when we saw a photograph of it, it was mushrooms, because they'd never seen mushrooms, because they never had that much humidity in living history in the soil. And when you open up the mulch, there's all these little animals there, you know, there's little insects and the soil has come alive. And the fungi net that's underneath the mulch is putting off a waxy substance which is repelling the salt away from the area. And the decomposition is locking the salt up and the salt is, is not gone, it's become inert and insoluble. So we could, we could green, re-green the Middle East, we could re-green any desert and we could desalt it at the same time. And, and, and if we can do it on an insignificant, flat, little bit of 10 acres of flat de desert, if you give us something with catchment or a wadi or a you know, canyon or any of those erosion gullies, we can turn it right around completely. You can fix all the world's problems in a garden. You can, you can solve them all in a garden. You can solve all your pollution problems and all your supply line needs in a garden. Now most people actually today don't actually know that and, and that makes most people very insecure. 
those examples led us on more and more so that people became interested and the inquiry increased and it still increases today. That's why more and more people want to know if there are going to be large global crises and you're getting results in such degraded land in small area to large area, our design system works with the natural system. It harmonizes with the patterns of nature so that we actually repair the landscape as we provide our needs. Because of that, we're helping more and more people all of the time. From those experiences, we moved on to the new institute where we are now, the Permaculture Research Institute. It's a 66 acre farm, Zaytuna farm, and here, when we arrived, there was nothing. There was no roads, there was no dams, there was no water, no ponds, no, no tracks. It was just a burnt out old farm and used as a basic grazing cattle system. We camped here originally, there was nothing here. The first thing we did, we set up water harvesting systems. We set up gravity irrigation from high catchment first, leading down so that we could put in our first gardens. We put in the long-term systems so they could get established like food forests. With no connections to the outside world, we set up our own energy systems. We built our own houses and infrastructure that will work as very efficient systems that cool themselves and heat themselves and catch our own drinking water. More and more people started to come and see what we were doing, even when there was a large drought in the area, that, the, the worst drought in a hundred years, our local village was even cut off from water supply and only had basic water and limited amounts supplied in the street. We were irrigating all kinds of crops here to establish our first gardens and running quite a few sprinklers. Local people would come and ask, how are you irrigating? You're not supposed to be pumping water. There's a, there's a shortage of water, but we were oversupplied because we had gravity irrigation systems from water harvesting swales and, and ponds and dams uphill. We could gravity irrigate as much water as we wanted and it's a simple system, yet people thought we were actually lucky. There's nothing lucky about that. That was often the comment, but this is design. So we could explain to people, you can design a property be, to be drought proof. You can have an oversupply of water ir to irrigate. You can have a, a, a supply of all your own drinking water. You can supply all your own energy systems. We're not connected to the main grid. We're, in fact, we're not connected to the outside world at all, apart from telephone. And now we have crop gardens that supply a great diversity of food. We have animal systems. We have small animals, chickens, ducks, rabbits. We even have goats we milk. We have house cows that we milk. We have beef cows. We, have an, we even have horses for an alternative transport system if we need them. We have grazing systems that help rehabilitate the land. We have food forests that are ad advancing across the landscape. We have systems where the animals help us by cycling the animals first to condition the land so that we can plant long-term food forests and, and not only food, but forests that will provide future building material. People now come here more and more for education. We provide 25,000 meals a year to students, staff and volunteers, most of which is all provided from the farm. We supply this as an example so that people can learn that you can do this for yourself. This we can teach anywhere. We've worked in climates that are as dry as possible, driest, hottest, degraded, tropical, large rain areas that have cold climates, deep snows, 
from the extremities of climate, from the large area to the overcrowded city, urban gardens, balcony gardens, how you can provide for your own needs, no matter what the limitation, whether it's a climate limitation or a space limitation, whether you're out in remote areas or you're overcrowded in, in dense populations, there are ways that you can design to provide for your needs and help other people do the same with cooperation. We can do this for you. And now we want to teach more people because there appears to be a tipping point with so many crisis potential stacking up in front of us. It's gonna be important to teach more than just people in a classroom. We're training more teachers all the time, but we feel, I feel, there is an obligation to be able to teach more people at once. We'd like to include you in that situation so that we can help get to a positive tipping point where we can help the world help itself move towards a much more positive and abundant future. <laughs>Do you have a pasture, a field or a meadow like this? Just grasses and a few clovers on the ground? Because I can show you how to evolve this into a really stable food forest system. Here we go. Let's go forward in evolution. I step over an electric net fence and here is a 50 metre electric net fence it encompasses 150 square metres of ground and we have a mobile chicken house. These are dual purpose birds. They're good egg layers and pretty good meat birds too. We have some feed supply. We have a eggs production. They're producing about 30 eggs a day. Their feed is on hand to supplement their feed. They have a solar panel on the roof. So it's got its own energy supply for the fence and they've got their own water supply. And they'll process this ground. We'll add a few scraps. After they've done this, we'll move them on. We'll pull out a few resistant weeds and this is what the ground starts to look like. It's just all scratched up and any weeds that might be here, it's a bit of grass here, we'll just dig it out, scuff it out, turn it over. And this has just had a thin scatter mulch put on it and cover crop seed put in. And we're about to start planting this with fruit trees. Just three weeks before that is what this looked like and this is the cover crop and here are the big little beans cow peas they're coming up and they're fertilizing the ground and we've already planted the fruit trees in position every stake is a fruit tree or a support species and there's plants like comfrey in here as an added support mineral accumulator there's little legume trees all the way through and fruit trees. So we're evolving. If we go back a few more weeks again, this is what it, this is the same system. It's evolved a little bit further. And we've got other chop and drop plants in here. And if we go back again, this is what it looked like before it goes to this. Now we've really got some mulch going down. So we've got all sorts of trees evolving. Now we can go back again. And we go into a larger system. If we step back 10 years, then we go into a major established system. We've evolved so we can do this system quicker 
with the assistance of chicken tractoring, large scale, en masse. 10 years ago, this was bare soil. You can do this on just empty land, ground that isn't of much value. You can convert very quickly 150 plus meters at a time into a permanent, productive, stable food forest system. When you look at this, it looks really untidy and unmaintained, but you've just got to trust in the natural system because it's worked forever. This is the most dependable system. Just trust it, work with it, get to understand how it functions and stacks up nutrient and, and becomes more abundant all the time. It produces more energy than it consumes in our, to our benefit. If you can live with that little bit of disorder in appearance, maintaining a system that moves towards permanence and abundance, we can live on this earth forever and in a system that we can be proud of and we can tell the future generations, we moved this forward and we started the new evolution of humanity. This is the future and the only future that's possible. Let's do it. What a great little fruit. Look at that. Wow. That's a healthy breakfast snack. Everyone should be able to do this. Should be there the right of humanity to eat food still alive. That mulberry screaming. Makes me feel like screaming. I can provide you with a common sense establishment plan with this design system. It'll benefit the land, it'll definitely benefit you. Sure, we can teach you how to put in a vegetable garden, a food crop system that establishes really fast and actually builds good soil as, it, as you provide for your needs. But those are annual crops and you have to know how to save the seed to extend those systems and you've got to get that right. There's quite a lot of detailed information that you need to understand and you will enjoy learning it. You can go from a diverse, nutrient dense food garden that will provide you with a lot of food and a lot of healthy nutrition. And you can go on to storage crops and main crops where you have to grow bulk food and you've got to understand how to go about that. And it's not that hard and it's quite fast. You can go on to animal systems and you can go small animals, understanding how to breed the breed stock on so you have good lines of animal strains so that you've got very good breed lines and larger animals and grazing systems. If you've got that much land, if you haven't, it's okay. You can do a lot with small animals. You can do a lot with small gardens. That's all fine. We can teach you how to do the housing and the energy systems and the water supply. Fine. But food forests, perennial systems, long-term productive forestry, that takes a little bit longer and it's very special because this system, the larger system, the kind of ecosystem of long-term productivity for food and building materials and fibres, those diverse perennial systems, not much recognised, need to be established quite early because they take a while to establish, but they're incredibly valuable because they have long-term security. If you get Lots of marauding people wanting to come and take your system down. They're hungry. They're looking for food. They're going to come and eat your vegetable garden out and you're not going to have any seed crop left to grow your next garden. Unless you know how to save a seed, unless you know how to keep that seed and keep it viable. 
and teach you that. If they see your animals, they're going to they're take your animals, they're going to eat them. It's pretty hard to hide your breed stock now. But if you've got a large forest that's productive and a diverse forest, it's kind of even hard to recognise because it's a food forest. It's a mixture of food and product and fibre and timber all mixed up together. It's a whole mixture of stuff. There might be some fruit ripe and that might get taken. But there's going to be fruit that's ripe at different times of year and people are only going to arrive in one mob maybe and they're not going to chop the forest down. They're hungry. They're not going to, they're not going to pull all that extra effort in to destroy your system in, if it's a large standing forest. So you've got something of great security. You've got something that will last. You've got something that if people do recognise it, it's going to be impressive. They're going to want to know, how do I do that? Maybe you've got something to share and maybe you're worth cooperating with. And you have got something to help people with. From that larger security system, you can build back to real survival again. This is a great security system. It's a major part of understanding how to build productive ecosystems as a design thread within the system itself. So your water systems, your soil systems, your animal systems, your crop systems, your tree systems, your housing systems, they all work together to give you something that you can work with as a family unit, as a community unit, even an urban city unit. Getting people to understand this together, we can do this. We can teach you as an individual, we can teach you as a group, can teach you as a family, you can teach yourself once you get an understanding of the information and knowledge, we can get you into action. Let me show you the farm. Here we are between two swells. In fact, there's a third swell, there's a fourth swell. There's a fourth swell at the top of the hill, an older swell, a, swell, a newer swell just above the driveway, the driveway on contour, then a swell following below on contour that's quite well treed. And there's actually a swell down below. In between, there's a walking track on contour. So there's a lot of elements on contour, but right in between the swells, front and center in this view, you can see a newly planted food forest that's emerging here with patches of mulch trees and cover crop that's coming out nice and green, summer cover crop. Next patch over is an area that's just been mulched and planted and then we have the chickens. So we have our little chicken house where the chickens are all inside an electric net fence. There's a solar panel on the roof. 10 days of scratching in that area and we can convert that into 150 square metres of food forest. Stage by stage, this whole section between these two swells will convert into a very productive and advancing diverse food forest. We've got the dairy laneway here, and this is a really high nutrient patch of ground because the cows are often shut in there at night while the calves are put into the pen. That means you can milk the mothers in the morning, but the manure flows to either side. It's actually an absolute ridgeline laneway. Either side of that is a food forest that's been put in, leaning towards a Mediterranean type of species. There's actually plums and peaches, as well as citrus and figs and pomegranates, and a little bit of a subtropical mix here and there because we are really subtropical, but this lower area of the property allows you to go a little bit towards Mediterranean. This whole area was put in with mobile chicken tractors. Every move of the chicken tractor was planted up behind with a, an intense planting of support species and the fruit trees that are now the main position. So over a period of time, the support species were all chopped and dropped and then 
the emergence of the mainframe food forest came through and this is now what's left um, up and established. And the chickens, many generations later, have actually come through and are now free ranging throughout the forest. So on the left we have almost an acre of food forest, reasonably well established at this stage with the now large enough for chickens to free range through out of their straw yard at the top end. And on the right we have an area that's now free range by ducks. There are lots of type 1 errors you could make if you don't approach this the right way. It is a system which works with constant principles, proven science that actually works with natural systems and you have to follow to the rules. If you don't get this sequence correct, you can waste an awful lot of time and it can take a lot of time to redo the process. Everybody says once they go through this educational system of design becomes a transformational event. You're transformed in the way you think about the process and you know that there is a system that works for you. If you're not careful, major errors can take place. So I really want to help you move forward with this so that you will know exactly what to do. And this will work so that I can give you three major approaches. I'll provide you with a video in the next week that not only shows you what you can do in the basic approach, the main three elements to start a exercise of assessment for purchasing land, rural and urban. If you want to get onto a large piece of land, how do you assess it? I can help you with that. I can give you a checklist of what to look for. I can give you a checklist for large rural land or an ideal urban garden. So you don't buy a property that's going to be a problem for you and difficult to design. And not, it's not going to provide you with the resources very easily. This is something that will really help you get started and give you confidence that you know what to do, at least with a foundational mainframe approach to common sense. Abundance by survival of a good design system. Food forests are a really special part of these systems. These perennial food systems are so secure. If you're interested in this, Pass this information on to somebody else. So listen, I'd, I'd like you to give us a comment on this. We're, we're always interested in your comments and, 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 and we're always willing to help. So post a comment down below. Send this to some of your friends or family or people you, you might think are interested. We're going to send you more information next week. Look out for our email and we really look forward to helping you move forward into a, a very positive confident survival future.